Hello, everybody. Welcome to Three Point Perspective, the podcast about illustration, how to do it, how to make a living at it, and how to make an impact in the world with your art. I'm Jake Parker. I'm Lee White. And I'm Will Terry. And all three of us are professional illustrators. We've all worked for all the major publishers in the business. Together, we've published somewhere around 75 children's books, and we've all taught illustration at university art schools. Each week, we take listener questions or do fantastic interviews with awesome illustrators. Sometimes we agree, sometimes we argue, but each time you learn something brand spanking new. Brand spanking new, and I've got a great question for us to kick it off today. This comes from Eric, and he says, not all practice created equal. It's a, it's a question based on something question. he heard us say once before. So he says, I want to, sh- uh, he says, I, I, I once heard Jake explain that all practice is not created equal. And he says, you were talking about the 10,000 hour concept and made this point. Can you expand on that? On YouTube, Peter Hahn demonstrates a warm up he calls dynamic sketching, clearly a form of practice. Do you guys ever use anything like that? Or have you ever, for someone learning to draw, what type of practice should they avoid? What kind of things should they practice if they want to expand their style? So lots of what questions we, right we, there. Yeah, like, what if is we do all some quick hits on on those each one of us? Because that might yeah. be valuable for him to get like three different opinions on each one really quick. Wait, didn't, mm-hmm. didn't we answer this question? Like, how do we warm up? Is that the question? Or what? It's not What's necessarily how you warm up. It's um, that, I mean that's part of it, but it, essentially expand on not all practice is created equal, right? And there's this quote that I love, and it's. You could get 20 years of experience or you could get one year of experience 20 years in a row, right? Mm -hmm. And that means like there's some people who just do the same thing over and over and over, never learning, Mm -hmm. never reaching, never expanding. And there's other people who, who every time they practice, they build on what they learned last time and, Mm -hmm. and push themselves. And, you know, for example, um, I, I see this in myself, right? I sort of have atrophied skills when it comes to drawing, say, a human face, a portrait, something like that. But I have very strong skills when it comes to anything machine or mechanical, right? I could just bust mm-hmm. those out. And it's because I practice and practice and practice the mechanical stuff, and I don't push myself on the the portrait stuff, Okay. So essentially, uh, uh, I would say in order for me to be a broader, better, more rounded artist, my deliberate practicing that I would be doing would be less leaning on what I'm comfortable with, which is what I'm good at, and more spending time doing what I'm not comfortable with and what I need to improve on. And that's what I mean by not all practice is equal. So yeah, you could roll up every morning and say, I draw in my sketchbook every day. I do five pages every day. And it's the same stuff over and over and over. Or you could do uh, the same thing one page a day and it's something really hard that pushes you and it looks like crap, right? But you are improving slowly over time on that thing. That's what I mean by not all practices is made equal. Mm -hmm. All right. So so do you, knowing that how terrible you are at faces, I didn't want to say anything, by the way. (laughs) You don't have to. My kids tell me all the time. (laughs) <laughs> I'm kidding, but I don't actually, I mean, you're, you're great at the, at like the comic style faces mm. that you do. I, I've never, I've never, ever thought, oh, he's no good at that or he needs to get better. I mean, you look totally competent at it, but do you, uh, do you practice intentionally to get better at your weaknesses or what, what's your, yeah. what's your plan? I'll show you, I'll show you my sketchbook. And if you're on YouTube, you'll be able to see this, right? So, um, Let's see here. Here's a page focused on head structure. Right? You are such a nerd. Here's a page <laughs> focused on hands. Oh my god. But see, drawing is his, right? is hey, wait, his trade. Who, who who did that? You did that? This, this is mine. Yeah. But this Lee, is me think learning about this. I don't It's like believe drawing it. is not your trade. Thir- Painting 30. is your trade. And drawing, I'm in the middle. I'm like, I can't draw as good as Jake. And here's another page. So these are actually the, studies. The problem, you know what? what do I do? What do I do if I don't have a weakness? That's my question. Right. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. <laughs> right. Here's well, the thing. 
here's the, well, let me just talk about this really quick. So these, I found an artist who does really cool faces and I was like, ah, I got to learn from him. So these are actually studies of faces that he's done, but me mm. doing like a Jake filter over the top of it. So how would I do those faces with my ink pens, my hand? And, uh, and this is, you know, you can see in the sketches here, this is me trying to do a head rotation, side view, mm -hmm. three quarter front view. So you're just um, leaning that's the kind on of his, him a little bit. Yeah. You're just saying, yeah. okay, if I leaned, if I lean, if you leaned yourself just in his direction a little bit, that's sort of what you're doing there. Yeah. Here's another hand page right there. As well. That's impressive. Cause I yeah. haven't drawn an actual hand in years. It's good like, stuff. Jake. Stick. One thing that I love, I love doing is finding an artist that does really good heads or hands or something like that. Um, and then just doing studies of them, like, you could do from photograph that's great or you could just um you could just like kind of break down their method and their style mm -hmm. of doing it so the thing the thing about doing that in my opinion for me at this point is i like practice for practice sake if you know for sure you're bad at something like i'm terrible at drawing mechanical stuff there is a huge benefit right. to drawing mechanical stuff but more importantly I, uh, as i get older and do this l longer it's i think it's more important to make something that's interesting and mm -hmm. i don't i don't do anything for an exercise i make stuff and mm -hmm. so fist bump boom right boom H how yeah. can i make this, something this, this that i'm interested in that's not dedicated there. towards towards that like if I, I like i can't draw somebody looking up it's very difficult, especially in my style, to draw somebody looking up, uh, looking straight forward and then just looking up. Um, mm -hmm. It just doesn't work really with my style. So do I, I, I would tend to draw something like what illustration can I have with a kid looking up or a character looking up that is as, a, as an actual illustration. I'm not just going to practice somebody looking up. You're not going to just waste time boring. practicing, Jake. I'm not going to mess expect? it. I don't got, well, I don't got okay. Do all that and stuff. let me clarify. So I want to be really good at drawing comics and in the comics that i read the heads are drawn from different angles and the hands are doing interesting you know expressive poses right and so mm -hmm. for me i'm like well i should probably be competent at that stuff um and so the, yeah, but there's you could, you could draw a page in a comic right. book of you of i think your we're characters looking we're, we're having this little debate thing but it but what you guys should be gleaning out of this is it's i think it's style dependent because jake you, like you make your living off of being able to draw these dynamic characters mm -hmm. i don't do that and neither does lee right that's my, a good my point. my thing is if i like like um when i used to play basketball a lot i used to play you know pick up games in basketball if you if you take a month or two off and you come back all of a sudden your shot's just gone right yeah, and I think drawing's the same way. Mm -hmm. When I in between book projects, when I when I have to focus on the business side, and I I go days, weeks sometimes without doing much drawing. When I go back to it, I can tell that mm -hmm. I need to warm definitely warm up and get back in now because I work digitally. I warm up as I'm starting to work on mm -hmm. the characters for my new book, and I just take a day and just start drawing those characters and trying to you know get them working again and and uh but i'm warm i warm up on the thing that i'm that i need to get done exactly um, the next mm -hmm. day i don't feel like i need to warm up now now the other thing is before i really felt like i understood how to construct shape drawing in three-dimensional forms right you know like mm -hmm. like draw anything like your class draw anything at svs learn um right. How to draw everything. Be, be, there was a time where I didn't know how to do that, and I was a working illustrator. I avoided that those lessons in art school, and because I was lazy, I guess, and because I thought I didn't need to, and I was I thought that my style was such that it didn't I didn't need to learn how to draw. And later on, it got exposed when I was trying to draw one of my first children's books, and I couldn't maintain the likeness in the character, and I'm like. And my, mm. one of my close friends was like, well, I would draw it this way. Like, it looks like it's not the same character. And he showed me some things. And later you helped me out a lot. Um, 
And I realized I was just pretending I didn't know how to draw. Once you really master the drawing and constructing uh, mm -hmm. objects and characters, and you just know how to do it because you've been doing it for years, I don't think you need as much warm up mm -hmm. to do my style. Now warm up to do warm up is different than than practicing, right? Or practice, so, but for you, you're doing like things that are really tough. Yeah, I I, and let, let me clarify. I'm not spending every day drawing hands like those were you know i've had that sketchbook since october and there's maybe 10 pages devoted to like practicing heads and hands and stuff like that mm -hmm. um and and so i i i agree i think there's a there's like a, a partial agreement partial disagreement here so like um i agree you like your practicing should be in service of the project but I don't think uh, I don't think you should neglect practicing altogether and just work on the projects. And last week we interviewed Nathan. Uh, that episode I think drops after this one comes out. Mm -hmm. Nathan, folks, but he showed these these studies. Or you pulled up the studies, Lee, of these sunsets right. and environments and paintings. I don't ever do anything like that. But for him. That's the world that he lives in day in, day out is I've got to paint backgrounds. I've got to capture color. I've got to get a vibe through the color. And so for him to practice that, like, that's just him staying sharp. And I agree with Will, too. Like, it's I've done that thing where I, I go in between projects. I don't draw for weeks at a time because, you know, uh, I'm just taking care of, like, administrative stuff or just don't feel like it or whatever. And then when I sit down to, to do an actual drawing, it's hard. It's like really hard. And I realize like, it's probably better to just, you know, to liken it to exercising to just stay fit so that if the opportunity comes that you have to do an obstacle course or you have to, you know, uh, run a, run a half marathon or something like that, you're, you, there's no warm up time. You could just sit down and do it, and so, you know, staying sharp, pushing yourself where you're not as strong as it applies to the projects that you want to do. I think is the the proper way to to practice. Mm -hmm. Got a new What's sketchbook, that? by the way. It's a new. Oh, Lee's got a, a new Aqua sketchbook. It is untouched right now. Uh huh. Put it up here. Wow, it's a gorgeous, that looks it's that looks so, nice. It's so nice, but anyway, yeah. So I'm getting ready to start a whole sketchbook project. But again, like Will said, it's going to be things that I'm working on now, but studies of the things I'm working on now. There's no, no never going to be a day of practice, but it's still stuff that I need need to yeah. mess with. Yeah. Um. Okay. So, do you think we we got that one? The, the I think we did pretty good. He he also talks a little bit about. Um, what kind of practice for expanding style? That's really experimentation. Mm -hmm. I I would yeah. I think what you do there is you, you know, that's where you go to your 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 Pinterest folder, and you you're saving the styles that you love, and then you purposely try to combine some of the things that you love about different people's styles, and you make mm -hmm. a you you make a piece for your portfolio. So it's yeah, it's, mm -hmm. you're you're in experiment experimentation mode. Um, there, there's there's an analogy I want to use here for for people for students who are in their first couple of years. Here, there's there's sort of a mindset we uh, a, of a subset of our students where they're like, I'm an artist. I'm going to learn how to do all of it. I'm going to learn perspective. I'm going to learn color. I'm going to learn all of it. You know what I mean? And, and and really try to cover the whole thing. So my analogy for when I see students trying to go in that mode, basically what I call that is permanent student mode. And so my analogy is with Photoshop. If most, if any of you guys don't have Photoshop, you probably should, but most, most of our students and audience has Photoshop. Photoshop is such a robust program that if I said, oh my gosh, I'm going to learn everything there is. I mean, you could do 3D in Photoshop some kind of like modified weirdo 3D. Uh, it would take t two years for me to get through all the tools and buttons and truly understand them. But right. what ends up happening is I have, 
out of all of Photoshop, I've got like six things that I do all the time. And mm -hmm. Jake has his mm -hmm. six things that he does all the time. And Will's is, is yeah. different. We all have a different six things. Ne none of us know Photoshop in its entirety, nor do we need to. And drawing mm -hmm. is exactly, and painting is exactly the same way. You got to pick the things that are important to the direction that you are going. Um, Cause it's useless for me to learn the 3d tool in Photoshop. I'll never, ever use that. Mm -hmm. um, and so you got to decide what are you going to study that's applicable to the direction that you're going. And that is mm -hmm. like Jake said, that's smart practice because if you're, if, if I don't need to learn three point perspective, if I'm drawing in the style that I do, I mean, it'd be nice to be familiar with a little bit, but you know what I'm saying? It's not a big part yeah. of what I'm doing. So I'm definitely not going to lean into that and do mm -hmm. a, a bunch of tech drawings that are in 3d. It looks like, uh, you know, a, a, well, just a really high tech drawing, like something like Jake would do. It just doesn't fit for what I'm doing. And yeah, so it, but my time is better. I short. saw you. The, so Lee, uh, like a month ago, got this, or maybe two months ago, got, <laughs> got onto Rebel, the watercolor <laughs> oh, okay. uh, app, right? And <laughs> and he was just sending like every day, hey, check out what I learned in Rebel. Check out with this. That was him deliberately practicing. How can I make this watercolor program work for my style? That's, right. that's the kind of practice we're talking about. It's very focused on what he needs to do. And now you understand this program. I mean, it took you took you some practice to get to it, but now you understand. Yeah, it was the about way. two about two months to get uh, to use it in the way that I'm going to use it. I thought you were going to tell the story of a month or two ago where we pulled up all those um, industrial design drawings that I did because I did learn all that stuff, and then I just yeah. had to forget it. But yeah. um, part of uh, just a little anecdote with along with that, Lee, is the other day you were like, um, I you might you said something about you might not be using Rebel as much because it's with the time consuming and you don't always get the results that you want. And so you, you've actually, you still use Photoshop a lot for your watercolor, right? I have you learned practice. how to, right. I saw what, what uh rebel was doing and then I tried to match what it was doing in Photoshop, basically trying to figure out how to get around the limitations of Photoshop. Cause the one thing that cost me in a production sense of rebel is it is experimental to a fault. Like I can't mm -hmm. truly know what's going to happen. And I don't like when I'm in a production mode, like I'm getting ready to start on this book, hopefully. You got to uh, know what's going to happen. I can't be messing around. I want to get done with a painting. Mm -hmm. I, I can't just be waiting for it to watch water drip down my page. You know what I mean? So yeah. mimicked the best part of it in Photoshop. And now I use them hand in hand for what they're good at without relying right. on either one for what it's bad at. All right. Next question. Uh, this comes from Tom. Render me this. So Hi guys, I'm wanna, a long time listener. You don't want to just t touch on the l last few things. No, let's keep it focused. Really? I, I got a I got a question. I want to run right. past you guys. I know um, this is just something that came from my business today, but I'm sure a lot of people might get something like this. I had a company, an art company approach me saying, "Hey, we love your work." It was actually the company. It was a rebel. And they want to use my work in some promotional images and a campaign. And it's going to be a worldwide campaign. They didn't offer anything for it. And since it's an art, if it was any other, if it was like Toyota or something, I'd be like, no, you got to pay me if you want to use my work in your Toyota commercial. So why wouldn't it be the same thing with software, art software? Would you guys charge for that? Or would you guys just say, hey, okay, you can use my work. I did make it using that program. And you get some, my name will be on it, but I would what do you ping, do about I would, exposure? I would ping them. I would ping them and just say, hey, uh, what's your budget? You know, what are you offering for that? You know? Yeah. And see what I mean, they, they, they of all people should know. It's a delicate balance. Like, I, you know, there's times where exposure has really helped my career. Yeah. And, and I would, you know, it's almost as good as money. <laughs> I don't you know, think this longer will. lasting than money. But then there's times where the money's, you know, more important. Your clients aren't going to be using Rebel. Are... But so... I wonder, I wonder in a secondary, I mean, maybe that's the actual answer to the question is what's the goal? What's the end goal? If, if, if I'm trying to push like, for example, prints and, uh, you know, a hundred thousand people see this ad, they might go to the website and buy a print. So if that's my goal, then maybe the exposure would. But you're right. Mm -hmm. A client was never going to see this. So what yeah, if, I'm not going to be hired. And what if they they offer, they give 50 people the same offer they did to you, 
and 10 of them ask what their budget is. And so 10 of them get paid and 40 of them are just giving their art away. And then you find or, out or, later that somebody else got paid for the same thing. I, don't know. I think the big, I think, you know, as, as we talk about this out loud, I, I'm going to stick by, if a student asked me this question, it wasn't me. That's so funny when it happens to you, it's different. If <laughs> yeah. a student asked me this question, I would say, we're not in the business of giving away stuff for free. Right. 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 So why 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 does everybody else get paid? If if I mean I guess working you know walking all the way through this whole thing, Rebel puts out this image, and somebody sees it and say, "Oh, I like that image. I'm going to buy Rebel." Now Rebel's made money, and I haven't. Right. All right, I'm yep. going to charge him hundred thousand dollars. All right, Jake, I gotta. I just have to attack that last question a little bit. Not attack, just answer. Okay. So he he says uh, this is Eric, and he says. Um, Please incorporate a cough button. Will, I love you, but you've nearly blown out my eardrums on a couple of occasions. I am so sorry for that. What I do is I hit mute so that I don't interrupt our podcast because we're recording on Zoom. But we also Mm -hmm. record, each one of us records uh, this on our own computer so we get a better audio. And what I'm I'm assuming is that it's going to get edited out. So knowing that some, I think most of them probably do get edited out, but some of them might make it through. So I am going to turn away from the mic from now on because I didn't realize that some mm. were slipping through, and I apologize for that. Well, yeah. let me let me ask you guys a question, just real quick. We, we're recording in a program called Audacity. Is there a mute button in Audacity? Surely there is. I haven't been able to find the Audacity mute button. Yeah, that seems absolutely. I'm, I'm scared to press a button right, right now. I don't want to mess recording. with it because it's recording. So. Oh, I um, see the mute. I see the mute. Try it. There is. All right. If I mess this up, I apologize. But here I go. I'm going to cough, and then I'm going to turn on the mute. <laughs> <laughs> did that work? <laughs> oh, wait. You guys uh, may have heard me. Well, we, we in... would hear you through Zoom, but did it work? Sorry, oh, well, guys. We're I having a... It. Now i got to do it again. We're having these technical experiments. Testing one, two, three. Testing four. No, the mute button doesn't do anything. I still see my audio... <laughs> Little uh, all right, squiggles. we'll figure this out later. We'll figure no, it out. Let's do it on let's do it on the podcast live. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the rest of the episode is us figuring out how to use our microphones. Uh, press this button. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this comes from Tom. He says, Render me this. Uh, hi guys, I'm a long time listener and want to get into illustration work as more than just a hobby. I've heard on recent episodes that simpler, more folksy art is the trend. I've noticed this at bookstores as well. As I'm starting out later in life and beginning my journey to find professional work, I'm 35, I need to build a proper portfolio. Should I ditch a more rendered, painted look that I've been comfortable with for a more simpler one that may resonate more with agents and publishers? How do I know if I should tweak style for current trends or not? I'm not against it. I just want to start off on the right foot. Mm -hmm. I'd say, man, if you're open to it, do it. And uh, and Wait, and see you're what you're open to changing the style. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, if he's open to it, to trying that a more trendy style, and you want to get work right away, then then do it for sure. It's a fine line. Well, because... you gotta you've gotta you gotta respond to the work in some kind of it was some kind of connection too. So hopefully, I just don't do something you don't like. I guess have, that's, yeah, that right. Would be... Haven't you guys felt like people that have styles that they love to do? That also editors love to to uh, print are the luckiest artists. Mm-hmm. Yeah, some when of that, a, I, I think when those some, two my overlap. The, mm. Yeah, my theory is that some people push themselves and modify what they were going to do or what they had been doing into something more current. Other people just sort of land there naturally. That's kind of what they do. Um, I. The thing that you need to worry about mostly is, is at the end of the day, if you don't love, absolutely love the style you're working in, you're not going to be successful, in my opinion. Yep. Yep. Yeah. It's got to, it's got to be a hundred percent. I mean, do you guys try to have, you guys don't try to have style now, right? You just draw just, and it yeah. comes out like that. Is that right? Cause I mean, when uh-huh. I'm drawing something right now while we're talking and I'm not sitting here going, okay, how do I draw? How would I draw a bird? Or how do I draw a tree? It's just <laughs> kind of like, it just comes out. And if it doesn't feel right, I just erase it or I just keep modifying it until mm-hmm. it just kind of feels 
natural. Um, I'm still get- trying to figure out how do I draw certain things, right? And because I know how like this artist does it, I know how that artist does it, but how does how does Jake Parker do it? And uh, and just recently, I, like I designed a character for a, a comic proposal, and I was like, I got to make the face look lean uh, manga style just a little bit because I know that's what a lot of the audience is used to. It fits well with it. And I'm just trying to get more comfortable with that because I never landed on like a face style that I really feel like is mine. Mm -hmm. And that's just me personally. You know how like you you can get sort of blinded by your own style. Mm -hmm. I know other people are like, no, Jake, you definitely have a style. Like I could see that's a Jake Parker drawing. But for me, I still feel like, Yes, there's some things very much so. That's the way I draw it. I cannot, for the life of me, draw it any other way. And there's other things where I'm still like trying to figure figure myself out. So second time you've mentioned the portraits. Are you feeling a little shaky on your face drawing? I'm, yes, 100% shaky on it. <laughs> <laughs> I look back at all the faces I've done. And I'm just like, I've I have like two that I'm happy with. Of all the faces yeah. you've done before... <laughs> um, for me, I used to, I used to really struggle because when I was working in acrylics on paper, I used to struggle with vignettes because with my style, I had to do an underpainting. I had to put texture down, put an underpainting down and on a vignette, I had to paint the image and then I had to use white paint to, to fade it out for that vignette. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm. Then I had, uh, uh, Martha Rago at it, it was at um, Penguin at the time. Now they're Penguin Random House, but um, she hired me to do my more um, um, abbreviated cross hatching style, and I was working on that um, in, uh, in digitally. And I found that like, and that's what I'm I'm holding up here. If you're on YouTube, we're at School of Visual Storytelling. But um, I can do these vignettes all day digitally, which used to take me forever. So I wasn't doing them. I was just doing like full pages. And I was over illustrating almost every illustration. And they weren't current. Like like art directors wanted a more um, simplified version of a, of a spot illustration or a vignette, right? And so interestingly enough, the technology kind of helped me move that direction to being able to do those sorts of things. But that was an evolution in my style that, um, but a natural evolution. It wasn't like you were resisting it. Yeah. But I also saw like when, when she, when she was like, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want your other style. I only want this more, more simple, simply stated style. It really moved me in that direction. And that's, and that's that's what I, you know, and she hired me to do the Bonaparte books. And, uh, so, yeah, so, I think definitely think being current is important, but the, but you don't want to be current to the point where you're just copying either. <laughs> so it's tough. Yeah. But I mean, I go back to my thing. Like he said, he's, he's willing to it. He's open to it. He wants to try it. That's how styles really are made. I want to see this person's, yeah. I want to see what this person's work. Click on the is link. Like, I it's, guess in the, it's in the email there. Oh. He, he does have a rendered style. Uh, so there's well, I mean, there's going to the, be what's the drawback to messing with style? I mean, what's the, what's the draw? If I I mean, if I paint a realistic vase or something, am I all of a sudden going to not be me? I mean, who, who cares? Which is mm-hmm. why why is he asking this question? I guess yeah. is my question because I mean, again, I'm going to go back, and I'm, I don't want to pick on this person, but I do want to go back to something we talked about a week or two ago, where I'm just noticing artists put these weird blinders on and these weird limiters. Can mm-hmm. I do the, can I do a style? I'm I'm a rendered artist. Can I do a cartoon? And and you know, or I've only done children's books. Can I do a graphic novel? Of course mm-hmm. you can. I mean, there's no it would be one thing if we did something and if it was bad, it exploded. And that's what I tell my classes. Like at the end of the day, this is just a piece of paper or this is just a file that you can file away. So who cares? Like yeah. do the thing that if you're wondering that should you do something, the answer is yes. Do it. So if if his top six images, which ones would you say? would be the most printable for a children's book editor. If they only got to see one of his images, All right, let me see. which one would get him the farthest down the road with most editors in children's publishing? Well, I, I mean, looking at these, uh, probably the, the bat, 
yep. swinging a bat. That's exactly what I was going to say. And you know why? Lee, just say the bat so we can all agree. No, I disagree. No, you agree. <laughs> on that. It's the white Hold space. On, they love white space. Yeah, they do. Well, I, I think that I think there's a there's a bigger problem going down through it, and it's not necessarily style per se, but it's how some of the media is being used. Um, there's an overly the reason you guys are picking the bat is not the white background, um, although it is the best one. It's because he actually cut out the character, and that's the problem with the rest of the pieces is they're they're overly soft and they're airbrushed, and that. In particular, I don't know if it's just people naturally pick it out or we've learned over time that when people are uncomfortable in Photoshop, they lean on that soft brush too much. Mm -hmm. But the rest mm -hmm. of the images have a softness to them that it looks like the natural Photoshop airbrush. And that style just does not work. Um, but the bat in particular, because he's cut out, doesn't have it. You guys agree? Like if you look at the bat, he yeah. doesn't seem like he's airbrushed and, so, and soft shadows and all that stuff. That's he seems a little harder it, edge. But I'm just saying as far as current, I'm looking through the lens or the eyes, the eyes of an editor. Right. But that, but that's why it looks current in my opinion is that he's using the media better. It's not necessarily a style change. He's just using the media in that particular image mm -hmm. better than the ones he's going full bleed on because those are all really, really airbrushed looking, especially go, go down in the image to the kid skateboarding. Um, it's on the left hand side that way. There we go. Um, uh, you contrast that bat to that image. They that is night and day. That is an amateur level image. Mm -hmm. It's airbrushed. You got a white gradient on the 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 right side of the character, and then there's a white sort of gradient on the left side of the character too. There's just spray paint everywhere. Um, even on the railing, it's spray painted, and it just looks really soft. It looks very amateur. But the bat doesn't have that. So it's not style he has to change. He just got to get better I'll with give the you media. That is one aspect. But I also think that the white space is really a lot more of a current look in children's books. I, it is. It is. That's true. That's true. Yeah. But I wonder yeah. if his other pieces had that quality, could he bring a background into it and have it look more current? Because that, yeah, I agree, that doesn't mm -hmm. look as current, but it that's also has that soft, airbrushy, Photoshoppy look. Yeah, I think I think you have to, as an illustrator, you have to be really careful about what you put in your backgrounds. Like, like for yeah. editors are looking to tell, they really want you to tell a compelling story. They don't want distracting things, and that's one thing that beginning illustrators do too much is we put a lot of superfluous stuff. I know I I was guilty of that for many years. All right, it's hard Next to be question. it's hard to be simple. I'll tell you that for those yeah. of you guys who are experimenting with the current style and all that stuff, it's hard to be simple. It's mm -hmm. hard to not add detail and and add a background if you don't need it. It's it's tough because we can go corner to corner and we want to impress everybody all the time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, Anna says, "How can I avoid the illustrator's curse in comics?" Hi, guys. SVS classes and this podcast have been a major help to me as an artist, especially on the business side of things. Your sage advice, dad jokes, and reliable bickering have also gotten me through many a morning jog. I appreciate you. <laughs> we should go running sometime. Uh, I have a side business of taking fine art commissions and selling prints, but my main ambition lies in comics. The guys over at Comic Live Podcast mentioned over and over how hard it can be for comics creators coming from an illustration background not to overdraw or get excessive with the visuals. I'm afraid that's going to be me. My work is pretty heavy on the details and it takes up a lot of time. I'm currently in the writing phase of my first comic and looking for hacks and efficiencies for when I have to start cranking out the visuals weekly. From an illustration perspective, what can I do to pare down and speed up? Uh, yeah, so I'm just going to pull up the portfolio here while we talk. But do you guys have hacks for speeding up the illustration process, especially when it comes to comics? For, for Absolutely. Me, I've never done a comic, but I, I did a book for Amazon. I did, a, I, just, I did six of them. I don't know if I've ever shared that work with you guys. If I could find it, I will. Um, but it was terrible pay. It was a terrible contract. But I could pick whenever I worked, and that's sort of why I took that job. Um, mm -hmm. And they were short. And so I wanted to do them as absolutely fast as I could with minimal investment on my part. And so I just went to a three-color uh, graphic sort of setup. And those are the only three colors I used. I basically said, these, you know, this is my palette, and it, they do not mix. There, you know, there's no soft edges, there's, and there's only these three colors. 
And not only did it speed me up massively, I mean, I mean, you could do finished illustrations in less than an hour, um, painting this way. Uh, but it simplified the whole process and it was less effort to, to think about all the scenes and it actually gave it a better result than the work that I was doing at the time because I put that limiter on myself. So anytime you give yourself limiters, whether it's a palette or a, or like a white background, like Will was saying, like you simplify the style, you speed up. Okay. I agree you with gotta, that. I also you, go okay. ahead. Will. Oh, I was just going to throw in there. You really need to ask yourself what you're trying to say and, and, and say it simply. And too often what, what artists do is they don't realize that, that if they don't maintain focal point, if they don't, if they're not leading their viewer through the illustration and that they have, they'll have either contrasts or colors that are, that are grabbing attention. And those contrasts and colors that are not in, that are in unintended focal point areas, create focal points. And those unintended focal points are yelling. It's like that, commercial with member the commercial with the stain on the shirt and mm -hmm. the guy's trying to talk and the stain starts to go bah, 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 you know and starts <laughs> i don't remember that but, yeah it was but like it was for it. some kind of uh um you know laundry soap but it was like the stain is louder than the person talking because the only thing people can see is the stain right and that mm -hmm. happens to our illustrations when we when we put things in there that shouldn't be in there so really like you have to ask yourself, what am I trying to say? And sometimes just say that alone and start stripping out everything that doesn't say that one thing. Mm -hmm. You'd be amazed mm -hmm. that you just don't need the trees in the background and mm -hmm. so much detail in the clouds. And Yeah. The, you know. my, my whole mantra while I'm drawing comics is clarity is king. Clarity is king. I just keep saying that over and over. Clarity is king. It doesn't matter how pretty it is. It doesn't matter how uh, well drawn your characters are. If the story is getting lost, is if the story is is subservient to the art, then you're not doing a great comic. The comic has to move the reader through the page in a way that's effortlessly. And there's some comics pages like the french do this a ton they beautifully render their comics to the point of you just want to stop and look at the art and not read the comic anymore right and so uh, th and that's its own thing it, it, that's great but the story suffers i think when it when it's too rendered you've got some great rendering ability here and i do love it when an artist in a comic just kind of lets loose unleashes themselves a little bit and shows how what a good artist they could do so my advice to you and i'm going to show you an example from from skyheart is what you're going to do is show your illustration chops for your uh, establishing shots so for like this one we're at a we're on a ship a flying ship we zoom in Next panel, we're on these characters, still more establishing, drawing this uh, this pretty detailed environment. But then after that, the backgrounds just fade away and it's just about the characters, right? Just about the characters. Anytime you need to show the characters in envi an environment, that's when you like to establish setting and to establish place and vibe. You could do one or two panels like that but then the rest of it, you just leave uh, as much detail out as possible so that these characters can really breathe, right? And they, and they can have room to, to exist. So you can see here how these backgrounds just kind of drop back. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just I'm showing as much sky as possible. And then when needed, I'll add location so that we don't get lost uh, in, the, uh, in the, uh, the spatial arrangement of, of the characters. Okay, so that's that's my sort of pro tip on on comics is, again, just save that, you know, do do the first panel as beautifully rendered as you do on on these illustrations, and then every panel after that, your brain can sort of in, input the visuals from that first panel into the. It knows these characters are there in that place without you having to draw you know, beautiful architecture in every plane, uh, in every panel. Um, last question here, another comics related one. Hey, can I, can I, can I give, I just want to give him a little bit of advice. Yeah. Too. To Anna. I just want to share my screen. 
Uh, oh, yeah, it's Anna. I didn't see the name before. Can you give me a screen sharing? There you go. Okay. Share on screen. This is just a little perspective note. Just want to throw it out there that um, if your this is called the 90 degree rule. Two, two things I want to talk about. 90 degree rule and cone of vision. Okay. We got 90 space. degree. If you're not, if you're listening, you've got to go to YouTube to see the visuals yeah. Lee's sharing and, here. And gotta, what, gotta are see you going to teach about utilizing your space so you don't run on the space? No. Okay. It's just when you're drawing something within a, within a <laughs> space utilization for the space. I'm making um, a comment about your vision going off the page. <laughs> um, that, was, that was bad. So it was bad. It's a bad joke. Anyway, when you're <laughs> setting up uh, your drawing uh, within a perspective system, like a two point, he's got a bunch of, she's got a bunch of two point perspective drawings in here. Two things mm-hmm. I want to talk about that I see a lot from amateur artists. And it's this, uh, uh, where you put the two points on the page and how much you include in that. And so the 90 degree rule I'll talk about first, and that is a little system for just keeping things where they don't distort. Two point perspective has a high degree of distortion around the edges of the cone. So if I go up here, if you're on YouTube, I'm showing how to do this, Mm -hmm. but this cone, this box is pretty heavily distorted, especially the bigger this box gets. Will you first show the cone so people know what you're talking about? Where is the cone? Hold on, I'll talk about that. That's okay. that's the number two. Just he knows what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just talking about where you're drawing, where you draw uh, your object on the page. And so uh, the 90 degree rule is basically when you have two sides of an object, they should be 90 degrees or greater. So th- this angle right here at the top of a box needs to be 90 degrees. Once we get below 90 mm. degrees your object will start to distort. Mm, I see what you're saying. And that's, yeah, you and have that's to what, see this visually to really understand it. Yeah. But that that's when, you, when you're when you drawing all of a sudden, you're drawing in perspective. I'm sure you guys have seen them where it looks like almost you're looking through a security camera. That's why. Is because you've mm-hmm. all of a sudden, you know, if I, ke- if I kept going up this way, now that angle would even get really is steeper. You know, the farther away from the horizon yeah. line you go, the angle gets steeper. And so that, so if you go, uh, less than 90 degrees, it will definitely distort. And that's how to just check yourself before you wreck yourself. If you're building, if you're making a building, just measure that angle and like, you'll know whether there's distortion happening. The other thing is how big is the piece of paper that I'm drawing on? So if I'm, let's say that I'm doing a drawing and this is my piece of paper, I'm totally fine because everything on the piece of paper is within that, um, that space. But a lot of people will put the the two points on vanishing, the paper. P- vanishing points on the page yeah. and you get massive distortion at the edge. And that's what's starting to happen in some of Anna's pieces is the vanishing point is almost on the page or it is on the page. And you're starting to get distortion happening where it looks like a, um, a security camera lens. It's too, it's almost too wide angle. And so that's how you control what kind of camera you're looking through. If you're drawing in perspective, um, is how close those vanishing points are. So the easy, the easy way to think of all this stuff in terms of not getting too technical is just put, take the vanishing points off the page mm-hmm. and draw on a page that has the vanishing points. All right, on now where's this cone get, of vision? The cone of vision, if I were to just be technical, is anything r- right at the vanishing points. That'll still start to distort a little bit, but if that, that would be the cone of vision here. Cone... Okay. A vision. I'm just looking out so for the l- little guy. Yeah, but as long as you're inside, if I just if I just made a circle using the two points as where the edges of that circle are, you're safe for the most part. But I would, like I said, I would still try to if I'm if I'm drawing on this as a piece of paper, I would bring it in like that, and so you don't get heavy yeah. distortion. Anyway, really I just good, see it a lot. That's a really good um, visual lesson. I've never seen it presented Good. quite like that. I got to give you props. And it, and if you guys aren't seeing it, you got to go to YouTube. Mm-hmm. Maybe, I'll, maybe I'll make a little video because I've got a couple of things with perspective. It's funny because I'm I have all this stuff on how not to draw in perspective. That's that's my specialty. <laughs> but um, <laughs> where, where where perspective goes south, um, there's a I've got a whole little presentation that's you know there's the lesson on how to draw in perspective, and then there's what not to do when you're drawing in perspective. And that's it's sort of a different lesson. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Last question. Can I do that? Yeah. Okay, here we go. This comes from Raj. 
who I had breakfast with once once at a Comic Con, which is really nice. Okay, let's get graphic about starting it in comics, exclamation point is what he says. Hi, Lee, Will, and Jake. Been following you all for quite a while. Thanks so much for all the advice you guys constantly share. Here's my question. I've started working on writing my own comic project, but the comics landscape seems to be continuously changing. Boy, is he right. So is pretty much any landscape we're <laughs> mm. in the world in the year 2023. Right now, comics not uh, exclusive to that. He says, if you were to start a long-form comic project today, how would you do it? How would you approach social media, online publishing, print publishing, Patreon, Kickstarter, all of it? Basically, how would you set up a comics business if you were starting today? Let's do a five-hour uh, <laughs> course, multi-week course about this because we definitely could. Yeah, it's a pretty good question, uh, but but he's, you know, he just says this is mostly geared, maybe more geared to me, but any b- business thoughts from you guys uh, would be helpful as well, right? Um, I, and, and I think you guys do have good insight that's, that's universal, not just to comics, because Will's launched his own children's book series, Lee out of the blue came up with a tarot deck and has done really well with that. Right. Like, um, so what, what would you, what would you guys say to this? Do you want me to go first? Then you guys fill in the gaps. You go last because you have, you're going to have the most comprehensive answer. Okay. You guys go first and I'll fill in your gaps. The one thing that I'll throw out there is I wouldn't make anything in this day and age that I wasn't making for a specific group of people. I wouldn't try to appeal to a general audience. I would make your your comic for a specific audience. Mm-hmm. Um, and we have some examples of that. I know Ryan Woods talked about his uh, Bottom of the Ninth, which was also an app, but it was a comic on an app and um, for iPad. And I think one of the mistakes that he made was uh, he tried to unite too many different audiences to, to like this thing instead of making it for one specific mm-hmm. audience and anyway there's probably a lot of examples of that but it's 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 and the reason for that is to you want to be able to market you want to be able to identify your audience find them on social media and share with them what you've made and if mm-hmm. they're if they're everybody your task for sharing that is exponentially harder and that's mm-hmm. what big publishers are doing and they have the money to do it but you can't compete with them as well Mm-hmm. On, but you can compete in a in a niche market. So that's all. That's about what's all. Our, what's our yeah. What's our phrase again? Pick a niche to get reach. Yeah. yeah, niche. Okay, niche to get reach. Niche. <laughs> can we make a hat or a shirt with that on it? So yeah. Forge your quiche. <laughs> <laughs> your quiche by finding your niche. Um, it's interesting to me that everybody, like, I'm seeing a, a pattern with these. Did you just pick these because they all say, hey, I want to do comics? Um, uh, I So here's the thing. We, I've been putting these ones off because I knew we had other questions to answer. And maybe I should have distributed these evenly through other episodes, but I just saw them all piling up. Oh, uh, let's just put them all in the same. <laughs> I just know that I just didn't know if there was a common thread of it sort of leaning towards Hey guys, how do I do comics? Um, <laughs> def- definitely <laughs> leaning into Jake's wheelhouse. Um, I will say this though, uh, in terms of starting to build a long form, long form to me sounds like it's going to be a long project. I don't know, unless there's another term for long form. I just want to be sure that, it, you know, if you're going to lean into that with social media, online publishing, prep, all of that stuff that they mentioned, are they there yet to really do a long form thing or, I'm just curious what Jake's advice is going to be because do you have a couple of successful shorts and, and, and smaller projects that have yielded some kind of success with both how the project looks and then also in terms of starting to build a following or social media presence or whatever you're going to do and understand how print works. If you do print a small one, I just worry about something that I saw quite a bit when we were doing senior portfolios, when I was in, uh, Portland at the, at the school where people would do these giant projects and they were nowhere near uh, experienced enough to pull off a really long project. And so they spent a lot of time on it and they didn't get much out of it. Um, so that would be just my concern for somebody going into that. Mm-hmm. What do you think, Jake? Yeah, I, uh, I would, I, de- I definitely agree with that. Like do the short stories, get those, make them, 
like bake in virality to them where somebody would want to share those stories around just to broaden your, your audience. Right. And then I would see which one of these short stories has the biggest like following, like people saying, Oh, I got to find out more about this character. I got to find out more what happens in this world, something like that. And that's sort of like your, your market testing thing. Um, because you don't want to like commit to a five-year project that nobody's nobody's interested in and and here's the like the thing people don't want to hear but you spending five years on something isn't going to be the the selling point for someone who shows up later uh and sees that there's five years of comics that they gotta like back you know back read into it unless it's good right and so how do you make essentially the the way you make something good is you make something short that's good and you build on that right you don't necessarily wait for it to get good uh and and all of this you could you could do whatever you want if you don't care about building an audience and it really is just your hobby right and i heard a youtuber i was listening to an interview with Doug Demiro who's one of my favorite YouTubers. And if you don't know who he is, he reviews cars and his whole thing is quirks and features. He he wants to show you the quirks and features of these cars. And I love his videos and he's been doing them for years. He started out um, writing articles about cars and he's like, well, if I've written this article, I might as well just do a YouTube video about this car too. And if people finish the article and they want to see visuals of this car and you want to see, you know, what I'm talking about when I talk about this this particular quirk or feature, they can go to the YouTube channel. And he said, I did that for, for years. He's like, I wasn't even paying attention to YouTube other than just uploading. And he's like, I crossed a hundred thousand followers, uh, from doing these uploads before I even checked to see how many subscribers I had. And then I realized more people were watching my YouTube videos than were reading my articles. And and as he was talking about this, he's like, and it, the thing that he said applies to any creative pursuit, whether it's comics or filmmaking or, you know, you're a musician making an album or you're a playwright or whatever, whatever you're doing, you have to go into it because because these industries are kind of fraught with um with with like so many things working against you for your thing to be successful like essentially you're competing for people's attention when they have Netflix they have Disney Plus they have an Xbox 500 or whatever they are now they you you they have sports right you have they have TikTok and social media and here you are i've got my comic or i've got my youtube channel or i've got this little album um you you're just up against these big guns right so he said you have to go into this with nothing to lose and he added nothing to gain mm-hmm. essentially if your focus is how am i going to make money off this how am i going to make this profitable um, you're focusing on the wrong thing, and you essentially have to do this thing for for years with that mindset. Nothing to lose, nothing to gain, and see where you get traction. And I think if you go about it smart and you do uh, a short story that does get traction and you lean into that, then, then you're going to have more success than just doggedly going down and doing that one thing Mm -hmm. that you, that you really want to do that might not have broad appeal. And Doug said, this is a great interview. You guys, he was interviewed by Colin and Samir. I should pass it on to you guys. Um, He said that, that what he would do was he would do a video and notice like these five videos did great. This one video didn't do good. And it's because he reviewed a certain car that people maybe not were interested in. So he's like, okay, I won't do those kind of cars anymore. I'll do these other cars that did have, you know, so there's like some market research of iterating. I'm going to do this. Ah, it's, it got, it's, uh, you know, it sort of got the response I wanted. Let's lean into that and do that more. Um, as far as like the publishing landscape, where we're at right now is 
you either work for Marvel or DC as a hired gun drawing um, in their style doing their books. Okay. I don't think that's you. So we'll just put that to the side. You have Image Comics and Image Comics is a great place to uh, for a creator to get their comic made independently where they have full ownership. However, those comics only really sell well if you're coming from the DC Marvel world. Because when you're in that world where you're you're selling comics to comics re- retailers, the retailer is your customer, not your reader. And if they don't know who you are, they're not going to order your book because they're the ones ordering your book and then they're reselling it to to readers. And unless you have a hundred thousand people, you know, calling comic shops saying, Hey, can you put in an order for this book? Your book's not going to do well at Image, right? So a path I see a lot of people do is they do their time at DC, they do their time at Marvel, and they get known in the retailer space as a reliable artist who their books sell well, and then they launch their own book at Image. And any book that does well at Image is because they've kind of gone that route before. Mm. Another path would be to find one of these creators who's transitioned over to Image and offered to be their illustrator. So you can kind of make your name, kind of hitch your wagon to one of these writers or creators who's who's really well known. And then your name kind of shows up in retailers. So that's the direct market. It's it's called the direct market comics. And, and, and we'll set that over to the side. Your other option is, um, well, in direct market, your other option is Skybound, uh, Boom Studios, um, uh, IDW Dark, Dark Horse, and they do take indie creators and they'll do their their books with them and they'll put it out there and you got the power of a publisher behind you. However, these I'll, I'll, some of these publishers can be a little predatory when it comes to rights. Um, they'll take these books and say, we've got a 50-50 ownership with this or a 40-60 ownership or something where you technically own it but as the publisher, they can go do whatever they want with it or not do anything that they want with it. So let's say you are happy to keep drawing you know, your character with Boom. And they're like, well, these books aren't selling that well and we've got to put our time and efforts into other books. They might not, um, they might not want to do that book again because they do have half ownership of it. On the other hand, and you can't take that book to image because they have half ownership of it. And you can't do a web comic because they have half ownership of it. Okay. The other problem you might run into is you might have moved on to other things and want to do other things, but because they have ownership, have half ownership of it, they can make a decision to do a part two of that book and not hire on you as the artist and bring on another artist, bring on another writer, something like that. So it's a, it's a little bit of mess, right? Usually these publishers do respect creators and you might not find yourself in there, but that is sort of the landscape that you might, you might see. Okay. So then your other option is to go to like the New York publishing houses, Scholastic for a second. Um, uh, you know, Harper Collins, they all have like their graphic novel imprints. Right. Um, and there, there's two kinds of books that sell really well. It's feelings books and it's funny books. So it's your um, your books about, you know, like Smile by Irina Telgemeier sort of set off the, the feelings books, mostly focused on girl readers, right? And those books do really well there. Uh, and so you put together a book proposal and you get an agent and you try to land one of those book deals or you do something funny like Dogman. Dogman's the best selling comic last year in America um, by far. And and those sort of books are the books that, that, that these publishers are picking up. Or I'm seeing a lot more of these like history and science graphic novels as well. And there you're usually working with an, with an author who's wanting to um, sort of teach a kid something STEM related, right? Um, so that's, that's your options over there. Your other third option is web comics and webtoons and tapas. Um, and that's where you just post your comic on these uh, sort of web-based things, and you can build a big audience over there, and then you could launch a Kickstarter uh, based on these this audience that you've built. Um, 
And so that's sort of like the the landscape of it. You know, you could kickstart your book or work with a publisher, and uh, and and or go in the direct market. And each one is fraught with danger and pitfalls and landmines. But each one also has their like, you know, their bonuses and their pluses to them. That was comprehensive. Yeah, yeah. But the, I, here's honestly for maybe a select 100 200 people being a professional comic artist is is going to be more of a hobby than an actual like career and the people who have a career it's because they did so well at their hobby <laughs> yeah that they're able to transition it to a career so if you go into that mindset, like this is again nothing to lose, nothing to gain. I'm just mm-hmm. doing this. Um, the the good stuff gets noticed and it rises to it, and and it builds an audience for it. So gotta love it. Yeah, gotta love it. Yeah. All right, I think that's it for this episode. Let's wrap it up. Cool. You guys, anything you wanted to add to it? No. I want to add one go. thing. Okay. <laughs> what is it? I posted a reel on on Instagram. It was about my new keyboard that I got, that little mini uh-huh. mini keyboard. Oh yeah, that thing's keyboard. amazing. Yeah. Yeah, the thing's super cool and I love it. Um and I and I wanted to just post a reel like, "Hey, check out this thing I got. I think other digital artists would like it too." That reel last oh, I God. checked had 370,000 views. Did did the, <laughs> did the the guy who made that, did he contact you at all? I haven't checked my DMs since I posted it on Monday. I should check. Uh, But 370,000 views, 15,000 likes. It's got multiple, all these shares, all these bookmarks. And I honestly, I tell you, listeners, I don't know how Instagram works. I do not know the alchemy that makes something. (laughs) Because I I was like, oh, well, I'll just do another reel. Next day I did another reel. Here's what I'm working on. Here's a drawing that I did. Got like (laughs) 15,000 views, you know, a thousand likes. So, you know, it's crazy that it has that that. many. Why did it go so so big? I think what made this was um, it's a unique piece of technology that that is just interesting. It looks cool. This thing, I'll, I'll, I'll hold it up to the screen right here. I mean, it looks cool, like, mm-hmm. and and it looks like something. It looks like a movie prop that doesn't do anything. It looks like just something that you'd have on your spaceship. Uh, Is it but wireless? To, no, it has a wire. Okay. You know, you got to hook a hook a wire up to it. But um, yeah. So I don't know. And then, and then there's some ASMR aspect to it it had the opening of the package the crinkling the clicking of the buttons which people like who knows you just said who a knows? bunch of bunch of letters that i don't know what that means <laughs> <laughs> you don't know what asmr is oh yeah bro asmr <laughs> asmr i think what it's you should know that asmr asmr yeah what is it google it all right we'll take it out here um no you gotta tell people no, what don't that tell is. them don't tell them. ASMR. <laughs> ASMIR. Yeah. Or something ASMR. like that. Yeah. Can you say that online? All right, yes. everybody. Thank you for joining us. Three Point Perspective is made possible by svslearn.com. We're becoming a great illustrator. ASMR. Starts. Your hosts have been Will Terry, Lee White, and Jake Parker. <laughs> ASIMR? Is that what that was? that it? I don't ASIMR. know. ASIMR. Sure. That's not, I'm not getting anything. I was an individual medicalness ready program. Is that what you're talking about? No. <sighs> Just do what type in, type in the, uh, some of those letters and type in sound videos. <laughs> Autonomous sensory meridian response and Jake, you misled him with the eye. Yeah. Th- maybe there is no eye. It's that tingling sensation that See? usually gets on the scalp moves down the back. of the ASMR. Back and you get that, you know, Just those to- videos that on YouTube that are like. Um, just watch this for like soothing. Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Like Smushing, creating uh, or jello smush, or yeah, something. jello and stuff in their fingers, and there's like clicking and tapping and yeah, crinkling. 
I didn't know that had a, I didn't know that had letters to it. I thought that was just, you know, like, it has a huge following. Like yeah. people like we have should have built done careers ASMR off of instead of illustration. Should we do that once every episode is just like have <laughs> some like perfectly placed sand and then we just rake through it. Is that sort yeah, of, you do it's, that in, or it's a sound thing, not a visual thing. Yeah. It's more of the sound thing. That's oh. what's going on there. All right, What's podcast Harry's produced voice? by Daniel Two. It's Daniel T U. You can see him at Daniel Two Special thanks to our show notes wrangler Lily Howell and our chief operations officer Lisa Fott. Now, go draw something. Have you? This reminds me. Have you heard of the Golden Balls um, game show? Uh, no. We are not allowed to watch that content in my house, Jake. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> It's a it's a, a UK uh, game show, and uh, it, it, the the through the course of the game, the game show it's a normal sort of you win money, you answer questions, whatever, right in the mill. Yeah. The genius of it, la- uh, it happens in like the last five ten minutes of the show. Okay, so now there's all this money on the table. That both contestants have access to forty thousand, fifty thousand, a hundred thousand dollars, right? Uh-huh. And in front of them, there's two golden balls. Each each contestant has two golden balls, right? And in one of the golden balls, it says split, and in one of the golden balls, it says steal. All right. Okay. And the two of them have to make a choice. Essentially, which golden ball are they going to do? Are they going to split the money? Or are they going to steal it? Now, if one person picks split and one person picks steal the money goes to the stealer okay now if one person picks now if they both pick split they get to split that money evenly Mm -hmm. right if they both pick steal nobody gets any money oh wow so your incentive is to really pick split so what happens there's a deliberation at the end of every episode where they, you know, the, the announcer, you could watch YouTube clips of this. They're, they're really entertaining because you're like, oh, my gosh, what are they going to do? Um, essentially, the, uh, the, you know, the, the game show host says, all right, you guys deliberate. What are you, you going to do? And one of them will be like, I swear to you, I will split it. I'm going to pick the split. You pick the split. I'll pick the split. We will get it. Meanwhile, I, I they know they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna do steal, steal right? Yeah. But the thing is, is if they both do steal, nobody gets any money. So it's it's nobody totally psychological, like like game <laughs> thing. What it's usually so fun. happens? Usually, what happens is someone totally convinces the other person <laughs> to to get split, and they're like their hands shaking on it. They're like, "We're gonna do it! I swear to you, you know." Look, if we I, swear I can hear this, I can hear this argument. Look, why would I risk hitting sp- steal? Mm-hmm. Why would I? Why would? Why don't right, we both get, get just nothing. decide to get paid right now, Jake? Mm-hmm. Let's just decide to get paid. You need some money. I need some money. Let's mm-hmm. just get paid right now. Something is better than nothing. Why would we risk getting nothing? That's let's right. Both, mm-hmm. I agree with you. Both Will play split. I'm gonna pick split. Me okay. Too. Let's do this game. Actually, <laughs> get a post-it note and write onto it: split or steal. Okay. Okay. Wait. So wait. I want to be sure I understand this. So say it. Say the. Say it one more time, so I know. I'm sure what I'm doing. Okay. Let's just, let's say there's a hundred thousand dollars on the table right now, and if, okay, since there's three of us, it it was me and Will, but let's do three of us. I don't know if it'll work. Well, wait. No. Let's first do it with two because that's the thing. That's the thing. Okay. Me and Will are doing it. Mess it up. And then I'll do it okay. with me and Will are doing it. Right. Okay. If. Uh, if we both say split, me and Will walk away with fifty thousand each. Okay, right. I got my but post-it if, note. But if I got steal and he's got split, I get to keep it all, or vice versa. But if we both do steal, right. we don't get any money. Here's the thing. Here's the thing, Jake. You know me. I like to put money in the bank. I mean, in retirement, <clears throat> I like to put money away. Mm-hmm. I am not going to risk. Going away with nothing. And I mean that. I'm not going to go away. You ready for the reveal? <laughs> Hold on. So you're sitting, you're doing split. Yeah. Okay, wait. So you're so wait, split. let me let me, let me me just reiterate. So I'm totally sure of the rules. 
if you split it, you then will both walk away with truly 50%, 50,000 a piece or yeah. whatever. Yeah. And I don't know why you would risk doing to steel get because then I don't you know go either. with nothing. Okay. I'd okay, rather go it. away okay, with so nothing. How much money than this are this is fifty thousand dollars hypothetically right now. Well it's a so hundred thousand dollars. Okay, no, no, so it's hundred thousand fifty thousand. I know mm-hmm. what I would do with fifty thousand dollars. Do you know what you would do with fifty thousand dollars? I know what I would do with it, and I'm happy I mean, it, I'd rather it, have it fifty to, than risk nothing. It speaks, Zero. Right. It speaks to greed. You let's know. let's both get paid right now. You ready? Ready. Three, one, two, two, one. No! I can't see yours. I can't see yours. Did you what say did split? Say? <laughs> Mine says oh. split. So what happens you... now? <laughs> so you both Will get gets a hundred thousand. I get nothing. <laughs> he just <laughs> took me for a ride. If you see me, me for if you're watching this on but YouTube, here, here's the thing. Here's the thing, though, that I don't buy about Will's choice. There, it's not real money. And so it's just it's just like playing poker when there's nothing That's actually. That's a good point, okay. and I agree with you. It's hypothetical, and you you don't know exactly what you would do unless faced with the actual situation. I agree. Now, now let me okay. ask you, Will, if you were being honest, totally honest, in a real situation where I'm holding a case of money right. and I'm going to give it to either one of you or both of you, uh, which or neither of you, um, what would you have picked? It really depends on the person and what the they're per- saying. I'm yeah, trying the to read person you're the sitting across. I, I can't go into it knowing that. Um, and here's the thing: like, if I felt like Jake was going to play steel, which I kind of thought he did was going to, I didn't want to pay him to do to do steel. So I thought he was going to mm-hmm. write down steel, but I figured if I do. Then if he goes split, well, I get it. It. It, really, it really speaks to it really speaks to greed because if people were smart, they would always just split it. Right. It's a it's a guarantee. But right. Every everybody wants to well, go for what's behind door number one instead of taking the money. And I people watched, are stupid. just watch Survivor for a season. I yeah. actually <laughs> wrote it on two of them. I wrote split and steel. And last minute I grabbed split because I believed Will. I thought he really did want to split it. And I did, but I, I know thought you, you were going to write down steel. But you didn't trust me. So, so this so was me trusting distrust. you and you not trusting me. Lee, I want to see you and Will do it right now. $100,000 <laughs> on the table All right. again. Okay? All right, Lee. Here's the thing. I'm going to give you the same spiel that I did with Jake. Okay? Let's both get paid. <laughs> <laughs> you know who you're dealing with, Lee. I know. I know. I know. I, I promise know. you this time, is, is with it, with all the promises in if my If you heart, do split, I'll, I'll stay out of it. I'll stay out of let's it. Let's prove. Let's hey Lee. Let's prove to Jake that we can both walk away with fifty k. Well, if people were smart, the pr- the problem is people aren't smart, and then you're even worse. Let's promise. <laughs> no, 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 no. Let's prom. I promise, guys. I already did that. I already got over on Jake. I don't need to get over on you. Let's promise. That we're both going to walk away with 50K. Yeah. yeah That's pinky. what I would do. Every, I mean, if everybody yeah. just agrees to yes, that. Yes, agree. Ding, ding, so you, tr- ding, ding. Right, you ready trust for the reveal? Will. I tr- I'm, I'm going to trust him, but well, here's the thing. It's, hi- it's hypothetical, so we don't lose anything. Again, yeah. it's poker with no money. Let's walk and away so- with money right now and show Jake that we, it can be done. Ready? One, two, three. <laughs> oh! <laughs> 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 yes. In reality, with real money on the table, I would never have done that. I, I thought you were from your original statement. Why would anybody choose anything other than split? But then when well, faced uh, with you, it, it changed. No, no. But the only reason I did that is because you had already done a, a steal and I didn't think you'd do it again. <laughs> That's fun. That is te- that is terrifying. It's a really tough to if money was really on the line, mm-hmm. that would be terrifying to good, make that uh, decision. That's fun. It I would be. Me. I mean, you could see just how you felt in this like mock situation. Uh, it's such a good premise for for a game show. Like that is quality yeah. entertainment right well, there. Let, let me ask you guys a question. I mean, just based on that and your uh, your tolerance for risk and all that stuff. 
if you're doing a game show like um, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? You remember that one? Right. Yeah. Where mm-hmm. you where you've got a, a good amount, let's say two hundred thousand more than you'd normally yeah. get in your normal life. Right. Um, and the questions are progressively getting harder, and there is the risk of losing it all. Right. How comfortable would you guys be moving forward in those questions, or would you would you back would you back off with once you with? Hey, I know how to answer enough. this question. I've, I've been preparing this for this my whole life, and it's not just with millionaire. It has to be life changing money. It has to mm-hmm. change my life. I'll go until I I am getting life changing money. Once I do, I stop. Mm-hmm. So two hundred k. That could that could be life changing money at some point for some people. It could change a part of your life. Well, I like two hundred k number because it's not enough to retire on per se, right. but it's a good it's a good amount. It's, I mean, like I said, it's more than most people get. Annually. I would probably bank that. I'd probably just, just say I'm done. It, yeah. Well, it also depends on like if you're 22 and you get two hundred thousand dollars, that's life changing money. Oh, it's a game because changer. Because oh, yeah. your earning potential at twenty two is for sure twenty thousand a year. So, <laughs> you know, before I had so any you, any savings, I would uh, I would have I'd jump on twenty k or right. 10K. But at mm-hmm. fifty, so you're saying two hundred thousand is like oh for sure. I wouldn't go beyond that. Mm-hmm. Back in the day, okay, Jake, right. you and Lee have to do it. I have to know. Oh, me and Lee doing it? Yeah, I have to know. All right, I need another piece of paper. All right. Oh, just See, just that's a manipulation it. right there. That's a manipulation. Mm. <laughs> I called him on it. I caught him. <laughs> See? <laughs> I caught him. <laughs> no? Or did you? Okay, Lee. I'll stay out. Uh-huh. You know what I did with Will? Mm-hmm. I did split because I'm a team player. Okay. Okay. I will say this. Let's let's truly, truly in your heart of hearts, close your eyes for a second and Mm -hmm. and think this is real money. This is the real show. Hey, don't you guys want to prove that two people can split it? Okay. Hey, you got to stay out of it, Mr. (laughs) Announcer. So if this was real, if this was real, like I told, like I told Will, and I wasn't just dorking around. I will split it a hundred percent of the time. Hundred percent. A hundred percent. Not even. A, not even a doubt. Not even a BS. Fifty grand is is better than nothing, and a hundred grand doesn't change my life a lot more than fifty grand does. Exactly. So, so this fifty grand that you and I are going to get because we're splitting a hundred thousand is going to. I'm just going to put it straight in savings. We'll call it good. Well, here's a, no. Here's my question though. Because you're, are you thinking the same thing that I do with the will? Like, oh, there's no way he would go with steel again. So you're going to go steal because you think I'm going to split it for real. See, here's, <laughs> I've already written it down on this sheet of paper. Okay. I, I have it here. You, you can't see it. It's on the other side. I'm stuck with this choice. <laughs> Hold it closer to the camera when you're now, ready. This, we this can't is, see your... this is okay. real money. Though. This is not hypothetical. This is Real money. And I told you, with real money, dorking around, I'm messing around with this deal. I don't want to lose the right. money. I'm right. pretty conservative better. Listen, my my word is my honor, and I'm telling you I want to split it. <laughs> All right, hold up your hand, both hands. Nothing crossed. We're splitting it. Nothing splitting. crossed. All right. Let's do okay. it. Okay. Three, Three, two, two, one. One. Oh, look who got the money. Look who got it. You weren't in that. If you were in it, I would never play the game. I just got 200K. Lee, we are a team. This is what a good, healthy business partner relationship. You guys split it. In re- with real Listen. money on the line, I would split it. 100% of the time, I would go split if it was real. If it was a real scenario, I wouldn't yeah. even question going for the steal. But wouldn't you just feel ripped, your guts ripped out if the other guy stole your money? Yeah, hmm. I mean, cr- cr- that's what crooks do. Oh, just They guts steal your money. Out. I think it would suck. I, I, yeah, it would. But at the end of the day, like, it's so much better to have not been the guy who steals and got and got screwed than being the one who steal stole 
and walks away with twenty thousand right. dollars because they you know screwed over someone. Yeah, I mean you got to live with yourself after the fact, and so right. like, how you know a compromise is good is both people are sort of happy and sort of not super happy. That's mm-hmm. a good. That's how you know it's equal. Yep. Mm-hmm. If you're too happy after a negotiation, that means you got the better of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, you ready to record a podcast? What did we accomplish do by doing this, by the way? <laughs> we, established we just know trust. each other. We know each other a little bit better. You guys know I'm always going to hit split, and I know I can't trust either of you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I said what I was going to do. I did what I said. How That's can true. you not trust one, me? One out of two times. Well, no, that was with you. I don't deal the same with everybody. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, you ready for this? I don't send my Intro? I don't send the IRS a Christmas present, but I do send my mom a Christmas present. Everybody's not the same. That's true. That's true. You were dealing with Will. I get it. <laughs> right. There's no question of what I was. <laughs> <laughs> All, All right. right. Let's go. All right.